It's 2016. It's a new year. Yeah. I'm sure the Lord's in heaven going, big deal. I mean, I've often thought, God is not interested in what time it is. He does, however, set lots of things in time. There are lots of things throughout Scripture where time is important to Him. And there's no better time than the first of the year to think about this next year coming. Not just that you'll be a year older. Not just that there will be a lot of new things this year. But if you could change... What would you change? If you could change, what would you change? See, most of us are stuck thinking, I can't change. This is who I am. There's not much I can do about it. Some of you are thinking, I would change my finances if I could. But when I think about that question, I think about character and about what I, what I want for this next year. And I look at that question of what would I change if I could change. And for some, it's going to be a question of, all right, what am I doing wrong that I need to do right? So, Chris, so January becomes a depressing time. Focusing on everything we're bad at. I'm not so sure that's really the best thing for you to think about. How about just looking at your life and saying, All right, God, we've got a new beginning, a new start. Where do we start? What do we start with? How many of you actually had a planned reading this year and you finished it in 2015? Raise your hand. Very good. Very good. Somebody just sold something. Okay. It's a new year. Her phone goes cha-ching when she sells something on teacher pay teachers. Yeah, don't be looking at it. I made five dollars, okay? I can't believe in the middle of the message you're worried about how much did I make? I can it should be. I'm glad it is. Mary Jo's thinking 90 days, is it? Yes. 90 days till retirement. 90 days till retirement. And then she's going to get a check for not working. She's really excited about that part. <laughs> she started counting the months, then it was the weeks, and now it's the days. Oh, so much for the message. <laughs> you know, I have... I have Three pages of notes, and Mary Jo just killed them right there. <laughs> I didn't want to preach that one anyway. I just want to talk to you about this next year. Not just as a church, but as individuals. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21, which is Paul's. Paul's anxious moment. Any of you have anxiety? Yeah. Everybody at some point are anxious. We're anxious. Paul is very anxious. <laughs> what? Wait do you hear what he's anxious about. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, and this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose, but I am very anxious about this. I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet, to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. And convinced of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, 
so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here, now here to be in you. In me, I'm sorry. Now what an interesting set of verses for Paul. He's, he's stressed out. He can't decide which is better, to stay or to go to heaven. Because when we go to heaven, everything's taken care of, isn't it? No more pain. I think of my mom every once in a while in heaven and thinking, I want to go. Wait a minute. No, I don't. <laughs> I want to stay. I have more to do, more to accomplish, more obedience to learn, more, more discipline to learn. You and I are practicing for heaven. That's really what he means in that first verse, in verse 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now we have a PA system back there, and Derek does a great job back there. But if I say, Derek, turn up the gain, what does he do? He gives me more of the same. And Paul said, for to me to live is Christ, and to die, well, that's just more of the same that we experience heaven on earth. Now some of you are thinking, I think I got more hell on earth than I got heaven on earth. You go through lots of trouble. But I want you to understand that the trouble is part of making you, preparing you for heaven. Because it makes you more like Christ. Listen to what James says in the first chapter. Count it all joy when you fall into <coughs> King James' diverse tribulations, troubles. Because tribulation works patience. Endurance. There is a purpose even in the pain. There is heaven in the pain. In fact, you will not grow spiritually without trouble. You need struggle. You need to struggle to, to witness to someone. You need to learn to trust Christ. You need to learn that trouble brings about heaven if it's looked at properly. And I think that's what James meant when he said, hey, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. He'll give you whatever you need. He doesn't hold it back from anyone. And what James is trying to say is, if you're having trouble, you need to ask God for wisdom because you need to figure out that your trouble makes you prepared for heaven and gets you to experience heaven here. Now, if you have goals set for this next year that are your goals, what you want to accomplish, that's fine, that's wonderful. But you better find out what God wants you to do this year because preparing for heaven is more important than preparing in your job and everything else in your life. You know, it's interesting when James says our life is like a vapor. It goes very quickly. The psalmist said, it just doesn't last at all. It's just gone. Can you imagine? Think about it. You will be alive for 70, 80, 90 years. My dad is 92. Mary Jo's mom is 93. And we're thinking, whoa, I thought 50 was old. I remember thinking 50 old. Now I'm 66 and almost. And I'm old. But my dad is 92. I'm, I'm praying for his genes to work in me. I want to live to be old. I got a lot more to learn. I want to take as many years as I can to prepare for heaven. I want to be prepared when I go. I want to be ready. I want to have kinks worked out. I want to have all those messy things taken care of. 
That's why Paul said for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. He was saying this, this world God has given us to live in, this is the incubator you are learning to grow and to learn to be like him. This is preparation for heaven. Imagine your life is this long and eternity is the room and farther. You're going to look back and say 70, 80, 90 years? That's nothing compared to eternity. It is nothing compared to thousands of years. Well, you can't even imagine eternity, can you? For all of our lives, it's always been things start and they end, right? Everything about life is starting and ending. We were born, we die. We plant things, they grow, they die. Some of you kill them faster than others. They grow, they die. Animals come, they die. It's always about starting and ending. A year comes and it's gone. Look back over the last year and how did it go? And some of you will say, well, this went well, this went well. This didn't go very well. This didn't, uh, you know. But think about eternity. <coughs> had a, had a um, doctor friend who said they paid him so much because he helped people live longer. Right? And I told him I helped people live forever. Listen, people. It no matter what job you have. That just pays the bills. You need to be thinking about eternity. And what are you investing in eternity? In whom are you investing for eternity? Because I look at it like this. I think at some time we're going to get all together in heaven. And we're going to be standing around saying, Hey, remember when we did that? Oh, there at Grace Fellowship. Wasn't that funny? You know? Remember when that happened? Hey, I remember when I was praying for you and you were struggling. You were sick and we prayed for you. Remember what God did? Remember how when we prayed about this, God answered that? Are you going to get together in heaven? We got a long time. You know how now you think, boy, I've got to get this done. I've got to get this done. You have eternity to get it done. Why are we fretting over 50, 70, 90 years? We fret so much over this life. And yet there is an eternity that you should be preparing for. God has, has some, for some reason, only God understands why he would ever choose us. Why not whales? Why not something else? God has determined to love mankind. He does not have to. He decided to. You have, you have to understand that about God. He does not have to do anything. He does what he wants. And he's decided to commit himself to you and to me. He's decided to love us. And he sent Jesus to die so that we could know him. For eternity. And so we say to him, but I don't care about that, Lord. I care about this little thing, and I care about this silly little thing, and I care about this thing, and I care about this, and all of our worries and frets. And God is saying, wow, children, children, I'm daddy to you. And he says, I love you. I'll help you. I'll take care of things. But why don't you get your mind focused on me? So the author of Hebrews writes, Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on him. That's what Paul means when he says, for to me to live is Christ. Fix your mind on him. Fix your eyes on him. You know how they tell you when you're driving a car not to look at the bright lights coming towards you? Because you're liable to <laughs> go towards them. We tend to go towards the light. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Not on the things in this world. They're going to be gone. You can't take it with you. Right? Get all you can. But you're not taking it with you. You better have something in your hands when you get to heaven. You better have some people with you. Hey, Tiffany. You got somebody going to heaven with you. 
what does it matter if you're the greatest teacher in the world and you have no one when you get to heaven? What will we say? Well, I was a great, I was a great preacher, Lord. Or I was a great teacher. Or I did my job better than anyone else. And we get to heaven and we find out it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. And you sit back and you think about your life at 2016 and you say, what really matters? What matters to you? Because you will do what matters to you. And you'll spend this year doing what you care about. If you want to know what you care about, look back at 2015 and see what was important to you. Look back at 2015. What, did you, what was important to you? Because that you will suffer for. That you will deny yourself for. The things that are important to you. You know, when my dad was, when I was growing up, my dad said to us, we are Christians, we go to church. Okay, Dad. My kids growing up, I said, I'm the pastor, you're going to church. <laughs> We're Christians, we go to church. It's important. I remember telling my kids, you never know what you're going to miss. God might have had a word just for you, and you weren't there. What matters to you, you'll do. You'll sacrifice for. You'll, you'll put other things behind you. Other things will not be important. Some things will get done. You will do what you want. I am convinced that people do what they want. That's scary, isn't it? Because as we look at our own lives, we evaluate what we really want based on what we have done, based on what we have said and promised that we would do, and then we do it. It has always amazed me how athletics can always convince every kid and every parent that athletics is the most important thing. It has amazed me. It doesn't matter whether it's soccer, football, baseball, it doesn't matter what it is. It always. And I hear parents say this. This is really good. I love this one. You made a commitment. Now follow through with it. Really? What about the commitment to Christ? <coughs> oh, well. It has always amazed me that we don't make that when it comes to for to me to live as Christ. Make 2016 your commitment to say, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be in charge. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to make him first in my life. I'm going to read his word. I'm going to be like him. And when I have trouble, I'm going to ask him for wisdom. Because it's more important for me to be like Jesus than anything else. I, I guarantee you, if that's your goal, you'll do well at work. Because you'll be a hard worker. I think you'll do well at school. I'm not pointing at you, kids. Why? Well, because your goal is to honor Christ. And the Bible says whatever you do, you do as unto Him. See, you're a good worker. You're a good student. You're a good person. Why? Because your goal is to be like Him. So 2016 is, my challenge to you in 2016 is, set your goals high. And set your goals about being like Christ. This next year, what do you want to see different? If you could change anything, what would you change? Well, Lord, I changed my, I changed this habit I have of putting everything off. How many of you are procrastinators? You won that star, did you? That patch? This year, say, Lord, help me. I don't want to be the procrastinator. Rick, when you got saved, you told me you had, you used to lie all the time, right? You don't do that anymore, do you? No. No, even your wife admits. No, you don't. Okay. Now I want you to put it on procrastination. Say, oh God. Oh God. You changed me. Now change this. Lord, change this in me. 
Lord, this is, a, this is an area where I need work on. God, change me this year. Work on me. Now, be careful. Because when you ask God to do something, He usually does it. And that means He brings trouble. There is nothing of growth that will happen until you have trouble. It is in the midst of trouble you learn to trust. And you learn to find an answer. And you find hope. Which means you're going to have lots of opportunities to put things off. If you're a procrastinator. And God's going to give you trouble. Now maybe you put something important off and lots of trouble pours on you. And then maybe you're going to say, hmm, I don't want that to happen again. And the God goes, yes, you learned that lesson, did you? But you let God work this year. But set some lofty goals for yourself. Don't think that somehow you're going to get, get changed this year just by sitting and listening to a message every once in a while. You're going to have to make some goals for yourself this year. You know, if you don't set any goals, you reach them all. You need to set a goal for yourself this year. Some of you need to say, this is the year I read through my Bible. Some of you need to say, this is the year I read through the Old Testament. Oh, Lord, help me. Through Leviticus. Some of you need to set a goal to read through the New Testament. Some of you need to set a goal to memorize Scripture this year. You need to set some goals for yourself to challenge yourself. Because you're preparing for heaven. I can tell you now that if I, the verses I have memorized, I memorized most when I was younger. It's been harder and harder and harder to memorize. I would have loved to have memorized the poem I read. I can't remember four lines three hours later. It's just really hard. So you do it now. Why? Because now you can. When we get to heaven, we won't have any more sin. When we get to heaven, we won't be able to witness. And practice will be over. Do you really think, like the communists, that everything is equal in heaven? It isn't equal in communism. Ever wondered about why communism doesn't work? It's silly. It disregards man's character, both that he is much more evil than he thinks, and that some people will always rise to the top. They always will. But when we get to heaven, everything's equal, right? No, it's not. Your works will be judged. You will stand before Christ, and he will reward you based on your life. You will stand before him. We got all the time of eternity. And God is not controlled by time. He's not going to say, oh dear, it's 11, we better get out. Oh dear, it's 12, we better get out. He doesn't do that. He's just going to sit there and review our lives. He's going to evaluate our lives. What you did for him will be honored. What you did on your own for yourself will be burned up. Paul, Paul said this, this is going to happen. Your practicing for heaven is going to be evaluated. Your life is going to be evaluated. Did you honor him? Then you will be rewarded. If you have not honored him, you will, you will lose out. So we get to heaven and we're all happy. We're all thrilled. And we're all there, and it's great, and God loves us, and we have a wonderful relationship with Him, and we're in His presence, and it is glorious. But, what will you have with you? What will you give to Him? If you have not lived for Him, you will have empty hands, nothing to give Him. The idea and notion that heaven is the same for everyone is very, very wrong. It is not. Paul talks about us ruling others. Who, are you, who do you think some will rule over? What is he talking about? It isn't we're all there and we're all cool and equal. 
It's much like the human race today. God loves everyone. Amen? Right? God loves everyone. We can agree with that. God loves everyone. But we're not all his children. Not the same. Because those who have bowed their knee to Christ, those who have given their lives to Christ, ah, they become the children of God. The rest, he loves, but they're not his children. That's why they won't be in heaven. They're not his kids. Only the kids go to heaven. It's prepared for us, right? So we're not all God's children. The world wants you to believe that we're all God's children. We're not. John 1.12 says, But to as many as received him, to them gave he the right to be called children of God. Only those who have Christ. You say, man, I'm a child of God. Yes, and what have you done with your life since you met him? Because it will be judged. For to me to live is Christ. In 2016, how will you live for him this year? What goals will you set for yourself? What things will you look for? How will you change? That's a good question, isn't it? Got an answer? Lord, work on this in my life this year. I want you to bow your heads. And I want you to ask him, Lord, what? There's more than one thing God will work on with you. But what one thing should you work on? What one thing, Lord, should I work on this year? What character, qualities God want to work in you? What activity does he want you to quit? What thing does he want you to give up? What ambition is not his in your life? What? Ask him. Lord, I want to live for you this year. What do I need to work on? Okay, just pray and ask him. And when you get something, just kind of raise your hand and then put it down. All right, here's the prayer I want you to pray. Hmm. I want you to take your hand, look at me. I want you to take your hand and do it like this. Like you're handing God something, just like that. And then close your eyes. And I want you to imagine this thing, or this person, or this event, or this character quality, whatever it is, that God showed you. Say, here it is, Lord. Say that. Here it is, Lord. It's yours. I give it to you. Change my heart, O oh God. Mold me. Melt me. Make me like you. 2016 is the year to change this. Now leave it with him. And pull your hand back. Lord, we leave it. We leave it at the cross. We leave it with you. You work out in our lives this year. We want to be different. Being a Christian is being a change, changed person. You have recreated us. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Now, Lord, this thing we put in our hands that we laid before you and gave to you, change us this year. We commit to cooperating with you. But, Lord, you have to work in our hearts. We won't fight you. We'll go along with you. So, Lord, do whatever you want to make us more like you. And next year when it's 2017 and the first of the year, we'll look back and we'll say, you know that one thing I had? Boy, God has worked in my life this year. Maybe it's completely changed. Maybe it's just partially changed. But God, change us this year. Use us to reach those around us for you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.